So today we're going to cover connective tissue in general briefly and see why these seemingly unrelated tissues all fall under this category. To start, let's go back to our levels of organization chart. So any tissue is going to be specialized cells in some sort of matrix combining to form tissues. And while epithelial tissue was all about the cells, connective tissue is going to be all about the matrix. That extracellular matrix is going to determine the properties of all the various connective tissues that we're going to look at. So to contrast, epithelia was all about sheets of cell creating a boundary between some kind of environment and the body. That boundary controls what goes into the body and requires cells that are closely linked together with very little space in between them. The structural integrity of the epithelia came from the cytoskeleton of the cells, and the anchoring junctions associated with the plasma membranes of adjacent cells. Although the epithelial cells were highly active uh, with their roles in absorption, secretion, as well as constantly renewing themselves, and all that requires a lot of oxygen, the epithelial sheet themselves did not have blood vessels penetrating through them. That is, they were avascular. So we'll keep that in mind as we're looking at the characteristics of connective tissue. All connective tissue can be defined as a specialized cell's in an extracellular matrix. The matrix, for short, consists of two components, the ground substance and the fibers that are secreted by the specialized cells. The ground substance is the background material whose consistency may range from fluid, as in blood, all the way to mineralized matrix, as we'll see in bone. So as we go over each specific connective tissue, we'll discuss the details there. So fiber is going to refer to protein strands and will mainly consist of collagen and elastin, which we'll discuss briefly. Connective tissue is all internal and so you'll never find it located on the free surface. That is, it'll not be exposed to any external environment, although it will be surrounding internal organs inside the body. And finally, connective tissue is generally well vascularized. That is, it contains a lot of blood vessels, cartilage, and tendons are the two major exceptions, and we'll see this is associated with their poor healing ability. So functions. The general functions of connective tissue overall reflect the wide variety of structure of the different connective tissue. These will be discussed as we get into each tissue type. So one thing I want to mention here since we are talking about it today is the role of loose connective tissue in connection with transportation of fluid and dissolved material. Blood vessels only reach so far in delivering oxygen and nutrients to the body tissues as filtrate and substances leave the capillaries. They're going to diffuse through the loose connective tissue to reach the cells. So the loose connective tissue serves as the final stage of delivery and transportation for those fluids. Also, the white blood cells, the immune cells, leaving the vascular system will stage their battle within that connective tissue. So these various functions will be reflected in the structural makeup of each of these subtypes of connective tissue. So if it seems weird that everything from bone to blood falls under the category of connective tissue, the main reason for this is their embryological origin. Mesoderm gives rise to both muscle and connective tissue, and that lineage is going to split off so that some cells become what is called mesenchyme. The mesenchyme will also give rise to all the connective tissue, everything again from bone to blood. These mesenchyme cells are what are referred to as stem cells and they persist throughout your life, not just during embryonic development. That is, you're able to make new connective tissue cells throughout your entire life, which will be important during repair of damaged tissue. So that mesenchyme stem cell can magically change into any of these various types of connective tissue, which we'll talk about in the next two lectures here. So after today, we're going to talk about supporting connective tissue, cartilage, and bone. And then for this video, we're going to talk about the connective tissue proper. And in fact, when I say connective tissue, I'm going to be referring to this type of tissue. Otherwise, I'm going to just call things cartilage and bone, etc. So connective tissue proper is kind of like the red-headed stepchild of anatomy. But it's the glue that's holding it all together. In my simple organism example before, talking about the basic tissues, this middle layer, the mesoglia, 
here it was attaching the inside and the outside layers together as well as probably supporting the muscle tissues and allowing a space where nutrients and other substances can pass between the two layers. For more complex organisms such as ourselves, the obvious connective tissue is our bone, cartilage, blood vessels, tendons, fat, but then there are all these other bands are the fascia that holds everything together. So this connective tissue will in fact be found under all epithelial linings in several layers. It's how we connect, protect, compartmentalize the different organs of our body and organize the tissues within that organ. So connective tissue is the stuff we remove during cadaver dissections to get to the so-called interesting stuff. But the surroundings of bone and muscle as well as the compartments within them are going to be organized and supported by this connective tissue proper. All the different types of connective tissue have specialized cells in an extracellular matrix, and we're gonna go into details of each one starting with this connective tissue proper. The matrix consists of the ground substance and the fibrous proteins within it. And for this tissue, the consistency of the ground substance is kinda of like a viscous gel-like fluid. And you're never gonna see this in your histology, it's really the background. And while it's largely water, it also contains these carbohydrate protein complexes. You don't have to know the details, but that's why it soaks up and retains water, which is going to allow for the diffusion of materials to and from the body cells. And like any liquid, it's also going to resist compressional forces, that is, resist being pushed and crushed together. You could think of stepping on an empty plastic water bottle and crushing it, versus stepping on that same bottle when it's filled with water, which is going to resist the compression from an outside force. So that's the matrix. It's the background you can't see, and you could think of it like this jello here, and all the pieces of the fruit right here are the cells and fiber and such within it. Another component of the matrix is the protein fibers, which are going to determine the mechanical properties of any particular type of these connective tissues. But in short, there's two main fibers that show up in almost all the connective tissues we look at, plus another more localized one. Collagen fibers are these large ropey strands, and their main functional feature is to know is that they resist pulling forces, which was referred to as tensile strength. Elastic fibers are the second major type, also resist pulling forces a little bit, but the main feature is that it stretches, and importantly, it's going to recoil back into shape. I'm going to talk about these two more in a second, but the last type of fibers are called reticular fibers. Uh, that's another type of collagen, and we'll generally not to talk too much about these. So for the main collagen fibers, again, think of a strong rope that's not rigid. It can be moved around. It's flexible, yet you can also pull very heavy objects with it, and it will resist stretching. Elastin, on the other hand, if it's pulled, it'll stretch. And when it's relaxed, it will return to its original shape. This ability to kind of store the energy in a stretch state and then return back to its original conformation, it's going to be very important in your skin, your lungs, your blood vessels, and other organs and tissues. Elastin fibers break down as you get older, and we'll discuss the significance of that as we discuss each system and tissue. So these two main fiber types are going to confer the mechanical properties of a given tissue, how strong the tissue is depending on how much collagen there is, and how it is arranged, and how elastic the tissue is depending on how much elastic fibers are within the tissue. Again, understand these two properties and the ability to withstand pulling forces is called tensile strength, and elasticity is the ability to stretch and recoil. So that's the matrix, the ground substance and the fibers. And besides the water and the ground substance, those other components are all made up of the major cells of connective tissue, fibroblasts. If you have the Martini's text, you're going to see these referred to as fibrocytes. However, I don't think that's correct, and we're going to use fibroblasts. Anytime you're doing histology, if you were looking at connective tissue proper, and I ask you to identify a cell, that is a fibroblast with the possible exceptions of some obvious white blood cells. There's also a population of mesenchyme cells, those connective tissue stem cells, which can differentiate into any type of connective tissue cell, like a fibroblast, when repair is needed.
So these cells are always in the connective tissue and they're pretty stable components, meaning that they are not moving around too much and they stay local if they move at all. The other cells that typically inhabit connective tissue proper are macrophages, which clean up pathogens and damaged cells. And there will also be individual adipocytes present, which function to store lipids for energy use. And in some connective tissue like your skin, there are resident melanocytes that produce melanin, the protective skin pigment. Then there are other wandering cells, all associated with the immune system, that are going to be transported to damaged or breached areas through the blood to fight off an infection. So these are only in the area when something goes wrong. It's worth noting now that the connective tissue underlying the epithelia is the main stage for the inflammation response. That's an important concept because inflammation is associated with or comes along with so many diseases and conditions. More on that later. So those are the cells and fibers that are in all the types of connective tissue proper to some degree. There's two major subtypes of connective tissue, loose and dense connective tissue, and within them there are three subtypes. I'm going to talk about the areolar and dense irregular connective tissue first because they're found all over the body, and when I say connective tissue, I'm usually referring to these because they're so common. If you've heard the term fibrous tissue or fibrous connective tissue, that's usually referring to dense irregular connective tissue. And I'm going to use the word loose connective tissue and areolar tissue interchangeably because this is really the most common, most widespread type of loose connective tissue. The other ones are referred to by their particular names, adipose and reticular. So every epithelia we talked about sits on a bed of areolar tissue separated by the basement membrane. And so together, the epithelial and this areolar tissue is going to make up the structure called the membrane, which we're going to talk about in the next lecture. So it's found deep to the epithelial layer of the skin, the epidermis, as well as underlying the epithelial layers of the respiratory, the digestive, the urinary tract. These membranes will also cover all the serous cavities as well as all your synovial joints, which we're going to talk about next week. And so areolar tissue is in all those areas. So what makes this loose connective tissue is the loose and unorganized arrangement and amount of collagen fibers. The collagen fibers in loose connective tissue are more spread out than we'll see in dense connective tissue. You could think of the difference between loose and dense connective tissue as individual hairs in one versus hairs in a ponytail or braid in the other. This loose arrangement of the collagen fibers and the fact that there's less of them means that there's more room for ground substance, which relates to areolar tissue function of transporting materials to and from blood vessels and cells of the organs that they're associated with. So the collagen fibers will provide some strength for mechanical support and binding to other types of tissue, but because of their loose arrangement, the tissue is very pliable. That loose arrangement of the single strands of collagen fibers also allows, again, a lot of room for the ground substance, which is really the final pathway for diffusion of nutrients, oxygen, waste, and metabolites to and from the cells of the body. The areola tissue is also heavily vascularized with capillaries, the finest blood vessels. Those capillaries are also how injections into the skin and muscles, rather than directly into a vein, make their way to the blood supply. So here's an image of your dermis, of your skin, which is the connective tissue layer underneath the epithelia. Now I know this looks like a mass of pink junk to you, so it takes a little practice to identify tissues in these kind of samples. A closer look at the loose connective tissue, which will always be located directly underneath the epithelial lining, and you could make out the fine strands of collagen, that is the red stained material there. Also, contrast the cellularity of the epithelial tissue with the scattered cells of the connective tissue. Remember, all those cells for our purposes are all fibroblasts. And we can contrast the loose with the dense connective tissue in which the collagen fibers are seen in bundles. Again, like those single strands of hair in loose connective tissue and hair tied in a ponytail in the dense connective tissue. And you're also going to be able to identify at some point the presence of blood vessels which permeate this tissue uh, here. And this may take a little practice, but I'm just showing you this here to show you how the tissue tissue is vascularized. Here's another sample from the small intestines that are especially stained for those blood vessels here. So you can see the blood vessels in that loose connective tissue, 
which is bounded by an epithelial boundary that abuts the lumen. So loose connective tissue underlying epithelia, that's going to be anywhere where epithelial is, like that serous cavity of the heart or the synovial cavity of your joints. We'll get back to those later, but I'm going to mention these now because they are often the location of inflammation responses. As in the case of a breached epithelial or an allergic response, this is the area that becomes a red, itchy, hot, or painful. So the term itis refers to inflammation and things like arthritis happens in the connective tissue around the joints. Pericardius happens in that serous cavity around the heart. Dermatitis is happening in the connective tissue underlying your skin and so on and so on. So that's the loose connective tissue underlying the epithelia. So here's a picture of the skin with a special stain that stains the elastic fibers black. And with a little practice, you can make out the borders of the loose connective tissue underneath the epithelial tissue and where it changes into dense irregular connective tissue. There's no clear border, but and you get into dense irregular connective tissue, you're going to see more collagen and they're going to be arranged in bundles. So it's called irregular dense connective tissue because the bundles do not have the regular arrangement. That is, they're crisscrossing each other as opposed to all going in one direction, as we'll see with dense regular. This is going to provide strength from many different directions. So dense irregular is also found everywhere in the body, surrounding bones and cartilage, muscles, nerves, blood vessels, the capsules of internal organs. So it is the other tissue which we'll encounter in every single system we study when we study histology. Then again, it gets a short shrift in anatomy. It is what we are remove when we're trying to look at muscles and blood vessels and such. So here's a model of the upper thigh where you can clearly see the muscles and you can see that the cadaver image, that top portion, has not had the connective tissue removed. And you could also see the veins, arteries, and nerves which are normally covered by that all dense, irregular connective tissue, they all look alike to some degree to, to the untrained eye. This fibrous connective tissue, it's important for binding these traveling blood vessels and nerves as well as packaging organs into compartments. It also has an important functional role in the interaction between skeletal and the muscular system since muscle tendons insert into the dense, irregular connective tissue surrounding the bone. You may also have heard of deep fascia release or rolfing, and all that refers to this fascia or the dense irregular connective tissue surrounding the muscles to help keep them in place. So dense irregular connective tissue and loose connective tissue are everywhere. As I've said over and over and over again, I can't stress it enough. It'll be everywhere. Every histology section you look at, you're going to have to distinguish between the epithelial and connective tissue, the muscle and the connective tissue. So it's important to be able to recognize this early on. The other four subtypes are more specialized and localized with the possible exception of adipose. But I'm typically just refer to these as their particular name instead of loose or dense connective tissue. So if we contrasted loose connective tissue with dense connective, irregular connective tissue, we're going to contrast that dense irregular connective tissue with dense regular connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue is much more distinct and localized. In this picture here, showing the muscular system, all the white area is dense regular connective tissue. So what you're looking at is the tendons that are associated with the skeletal muscle. Tendons attach muscle to bone. Ligaments attach bone to bone, but they're basically the same dense, regular connective tissue. Both tendons and ligaments tend to heal poorly if damaged, and this reflects the fact that dense, regular connective tissue is poorly vascularized. So this is the major difference with the dense, irregular connective tissue. This dense, regular also has bundles of collagen fibers, except that these collagen bundles are arranged in parallel. And this reflects its function as attaching muscle to bone where the tension generated is going to be always in a very specific direction. So back to comparing the two, the dense regular and dense irregular, the collagen fibers are going to withstand pulling in one direction very strongly in the tendons and ligaments, whereas the dense irregular is going to strand multi-directional force because of the way the fibers are arranged in all different directions. 
All right, and the last dense connective tissue is a little like dense regular or irregular, except that it contains a lot of elastic fibers. And these are going to be found where are the organs or blood vessels undergo rapid expansion, such as your major arteries shown here. In this stain, the elastic fibers are stained black, so are easy to visualize. Otherwise, you usually cannot see them. The arteries contain a lot of elastic fibers and all the layers, but this outside layer surrounding the artery has this elastic connective tissue so you can see the black fibers interwoven with the red collagen fibers in this case. So you'll hear more about this when we talk about the vascular system. And the other two loose connective tissues are adipose and reticular. So adipose cells can be found within other connective tissue, but when that loose connective tissue is predominantly adipose cell, it's referred to as adipose tissue. And so in contrast to other connective tissues, this has very little matrix, very little extracellular space because the entire tissue is taken up by large fat cells. So when you gain weight, it's often just these cells filling up more and more rather than adding extra cells. Adipose tissue is set under the dermis of your skin, providing a layer of insulation, cushioning, and padding. There's also abdominal fat in a different location, but that is also adipose tissue. So when you're trying to identify adipose tissue, you're going to be looking for these large spaces, which is the outline of the adipose cells, and the actual lipid has been dissolved in the preparation process. So the last type of loose connective tissue is one we won't really encounter really after this. It is reticular tissue, and its main fibers are a particular type of thin collagen. And it's found in those protected soft organs like your liver, kidney, and spleen to provide a framework for the working cells of that organs. So that's it for the connective tissue proper. Next, we're going to combine that epithelial that we learned about with the connective tissue that we learned about for our first organ, a membrane. See you next time.